Hello everyone, and welcome to the Grad Project tutorial. Today I'm here with Vincent Ju, and Vincent's gonna be showing us an amazing project using Amazon SageMaker Studio Lab. Say hello to everyone, Vincent. Thanks, Curtis, for the introduction. Everyone, my name is Vincent Shu. I'm a recent graduate from the Information Security Policy and Management Program at CMU, and I aspire to become a security engineer. Awesome. So uh, today, as I mentioned, we're going to be working with Amazon SageMaker Studio Lab for your project. Uh, but before we start, why don't you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to get into machine learning? Right. So I had the uh, fortune to intern as a security engineer last year at Amazon. And uh, through kind of the iteration of detection rules based on previously the signatures and uh, network signals and logs, we started to gradually look at uh, heuristics and prob probabilistic um, features from all these data. So it's essentially a natural progression that security is essentially going to use a lot of the best practices from machine learning and AI. Um, so for me, it was a perfect time to dive into this uh, interesting and exciting space. Awesome. Super excited to have you here today and looking forward to an exciting demo. Thank you so much. Why don't we go ahead and have you start with the demo, Vincent? Right. So uh, when you have a chance to, to check out the uh, GitHub repository, it'll look like this. And I've embedded the link to the notebook right over here. So one neat thing in this notebook is that there is a button that you can click and it will automatically migrate the entire repository into SageMaker Studio Lab. So let's do that. Now I've previously opened the instance in the background. Uh, right now the only thing left to do is to copy the project and it'll ask you how would you like to do that? We wanna make sure everything is loaded in, um, which means the entire repository. So there we go, clone entire repo. All right, we don't really need to open README uh, and we have our own environment to set up. So simple, let's do the clone. Boom, boom. Uh, the next part uh, is really uh, setting up the environment so that the project can run accordingly. Uh, this might take a, take a few minutes. So. Uh, be patient, but it's going to get, get done. So this is basically SageMaker Studio Lab taking everything out of the GitHub repository right. and making it available for you to run your analysis. Exactly, Great. exactly. So the notebook is in this uh, rat SQL gap folder right over here. And all the instructions that you need are over here. So let's uh, follow it uh, one, one step by step. Now, before we get to that, I want to give some credits to the original author of the gen, uh, Generation Augmented Pre-Train uh, paper, the, the GAP model paper. Uh, so big shout out to AWS AI Labs and the re researchers at University of Waterloo. Um, and just a brief uh, overview, some of the data sets we are going to use today, it's called the Bank Account Fraud data set. Uh, and we found this on Kaggle, so we want to make sure the credit is due. All right, great. Tell us a little bit about the data source. Yeah, so within the list of sources, I have embedded the bank account fraud data set suite found from Kaggle. And this is what the source looks like if you want to download the database itself. Essentially, it's a synthesized data set that simulates what a real life banking investigation could look like. Now, some, uh, it's got a lot of columns. Um, so to really give you a brief overview, I will also shift gears to talk about how our worksheets work. Uh, work. Essentially, the data set has been built into an actual database uh, to simulate how analysts work in their daily life. And to give you a brief overview, this is a quick SQL query that we can pass in so we can look at what the data set looks like. So you can have, right, you have your credit risk score, email is free, uh, phone, home phone valid, all across all these uh, columns essentially. 
uh, into the devices that they are using, um, operating systems. It's a wide variety of features that we can investigate. And by having synthesized data, that means we're not using actual customer data from a specific bank. Correct. There is no concern of uh, any violation in this demonstration. Feel free to uh, investigate the data set on your own. I think the fact that you have access to synthesized data uh, is also helpful for other use cases, whether it be something like healthcare, uh, insurance, uh, or any industry for that matter. Yeah, coming from a security background, really uh, staying within the constraints of, of data pr protection uh, policies is very important. Indeed. And this is helpful for our uh, developer. Very uh, good. Yeah. So let's get, get uh, started with the setup. So uh, one neat thing about uh, SageMaker Studio Lab is that one environment is already pre-installed. It's called default. And so what we do is basically start a new terminal so we can start to interact with the environment itself. And when you say default environment, you're actually talking about a pre-built, ready-to-go kernel that's going to allow everyone to run their commands, set up their environments, uh, install their uh, toolkits, and be able to process data. Exactly. So the first command is activating the default uh, environment and already pasted in uh, the command to install uh, Python version 3.7. Uh, this is a uh, it's slightly older project, yeah. but uh, again, this is all dependency set up, so no worries about uh, versioning. It's it's all within our our uh, calculation. It's a version of Python that works for your project. Exactly. So someone else who needs a more current version of Python, they could choose to go with 3.9 or, or some other version yeah. if they need to. Yeah, use all the bells and whistles that Python can offer. Perfect. Yep. So, other than the 3.7 Python, we also need Conda Forge, um, JSONnet, and OpenJDK. So some some of you might uh, be curious, why do we need Java in this uh, in this demo? You'll, you'll see. There's a very interesting uh, package uh, from Stanford, Core NLP. They actually use uh, some of the JSON uh, Java dependencies. Core, uh, Core NLP stands for Core Natural Language Processing. Correct. Natural language, natural language processing is at the core of what you're doing <laughs> in terms of being able to use the models to process natural language. Exactly, exactly. It's very important to uh, the inference that we're going to do eventually. And uh, let me run another command uh, just uh, simultaneously. So through this plus button, you can get another terminal opened up. Again, we want to make sure we're in the default uh, environment. Activate default. And we want to run this conda install. So we're running things simultaneously. It'll save you some time. So when we can get to the uh, interesting inference part. All right. This also the same way. Let's see how this is doing. Okay, a little bit more time. Install PyTorch. So CUDA Toolkit, the second tool, is uh, is a readiness for uh, running some commands on GPU. Um, now, for the purpose of our demo today, uh, we only used the CPU capability uh, that's in SageMaker Studio Lab. But if, for example, someone wants to fine tune the model or even uh, continue to train the model, uh, you can leverage some of the computing resources, such as a G GPU engine uh, that's offered on uh, SageMaker, so you can continue to develop on this model. In other words, uh, if at any time you have a project that's running uh, using CPU processes, if you need to switch to GPU, you can simply do so on the fly. Exactly. Any... All right, so the conda commands are finished. Now let's uh, shift gears and in. in uh, pip installing some of the Python dependencies in this txt file. So basically, it's a list that of some of the Python packages that you're going to use. And the install for this is to read in that txt file. So a sanity check, OK, we're in the right directory. And then go ahead and fire that up. Um, this is running pretty quickly just because I've been running this command on this instance. But uh, just bear in mind, it might take a few minutes for you. Uh, uh, if you are installing these in the, uh, for the first time. Now, uh, the models and libraries are going to be some of the bigger files that we uh, download 
uh, straight from uh, SageMaker Studio. So we want to, again, sanity check we're in the right directory. And the command here is going to create a separate folder and using curl to download the uh, fine-tune checkpoint. So there are two big files. One is the fine-tune checkpoint, and the other one is the pre-trained model. And these are going to be read in uh, uh, simultaneously. So they, are, they arrive at exactly where the training finished uh, from the author's experimentation. So, And as far as the structure of the project is concerned, you're going to create a separate directory so that you have a landing space to where those files can be downloaded, correct? Exactly, yes. So let me run this. So the first command is make, making a new directory, and then the second command doing the download. Uh, we can also simultaneously download the other asset through a separate terminal which is the pre-trained model right here. Again, these are all trialed and errored, so you, you just worry about copy and pasting into it and run it, it's going to work. Cool. Another download that we can do is the Stanford Core Natural Language Processing Java Library. Again, it's the same uh, idea where you create a separate folder, in this case it's called third party, and then within that we're going to um, download the zip file, but also we, we need to unpack this zip file within the exact folder. So let's go ahead and get onto that. Was there any particular reason why you chose the packages from the Stanford libraries? Were there other options available to you as part of the project? Yeah, so within uh, uh, Stanford Core NLP, there are just multiple functionalities in terms of uh, sp uh, part of speech recognition, uh, tokenization. It's, it's a full suite of capabilities that you can leverage to uh, amplify your project. And for this project, you know, because of their expertise in analyzing a sequence of words, in our case, an utterance, um, it's it's the perfect tool set that to uh, do some of the pre-processing uh, before the, the model answers our question. Perfect. All right, downloading very quickly. I believe the command to unzip is also pasted in here, so we, uh, be mindful of running that, otherwise the zip file is not going to help you uh, <laughs> with the dependencies. And the fact that we are downloading a zip file means that it's a it's a compressed, smaller asset, which makes it easier to download. And then once available, we can extract it into the environment. It's a lot of Java libraries within that zip file, and combined with the OpenJDK installed in the Conda environment, it's going to uh, work seamlessly with the Python code that is the model. All right, unzip the asset still into the third party directory. Great, all assets being extracted. Yep, and this will conclude the bigger uh, assets that we download. And let's shift gears into the uh, NLTK package. So just a little bit of context, NLTK stands for Natural Language Toolset, uh, Toolkit, and it's a widely used library for analyzing human uh, language data. So the two sub-packages that we want to install here, the first one is called stop words. And basically, they are some of the words that offer little contribution to um, understanding what the sentence is about. For example, the is and um, and uh, some of the filler words al along with the Things punctuation. Like and. Yep. Oh, it's also a filler word. Yeah. Yep. And uh, punct is a tokenized tokenizer that helps splitting our sentences into different tokens. For example, the sentence, my name is Vincent, is going to split this sentence into four tokens. My name is Vincent. And through that, we are going to be filtering on that sentence so we can actually focus on the more interesting part of the sentence, in this case, Vincent, hopefully, and uh, uh, so we can carry on with the analysis and inferences. I think one of the benefits of being able to leverage Punk is that it processes things that aren't labeled. Right. That correct? Yeah. Right. So now we're ready to run the NLTK package. All right. Hopefully it's doing the download on its own, and it is. And it's finished. Great. Okay, so we have 
download the packages, we have installed the dependencies, and we have uh, the right tool set within NLTK to carry on our analysis. So we can actually get to the actual Python code part that we want to run. And the Python code, you'll now be able to run directly from the notebook, whereas as part of the uh, environment setup, some of the downloads and the in, uh, uh, environment creation, we took advantage of some of the terminals that are available within the project. Exactly. And one uh, interesting feature within the Studio Lab is that you can manage processes very uh, clearly. So for example, we, ha we have opened all these terminals and we can just shut down all the terminals. So we can save the computing powers for our specific notebook instances. And it's also a cost saving measure, right? So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good practice. So uh, importing JSON OS and also JSON net, these are some of the Python dependencies. Also, the, within the project itself, uh, within the commands folder, within the spider data set, and also utilities, there are some functions that we also want to pull in. And also, most importantly, we want the PyTorch dependency as well. Any recommendations to the viewers of how they can go and get a little more reference information on a language like Python? Would a, a python.org website be sufficient for going and, and getting in more information? Yeah, so python.com I think is you know where you follow up with the latest version of the Python language, but um, for kind of the machine learning uh, space and also data analysis, uh, I would recommend uh, NumPy, I would recommend uh, PyTorch and also TensorFlow. Those are some of the frequent documentations and references that we also need to refresh refresh on so we can write the right code to do the do the job. Okay, so we've now taken the uh, assets that we have in the GitHub repository. We've made them available to the project within SageMaker Studio Lab. Okay, so Vincent, talk to us a little bit about what we're gonna do next. So, uh, let, let's lay some context uh, within this, this uh, lab that we're currently in. So what we aim to do is use a, uh, a machine learning model that translates text into SQL languages, uh, SQL queries, so we can do some investigation on a uh, bank fraud uh, data set. So we can uh, start to correlate and understand the profiles and the, the, the factors that go into a fraudulent uh, transaction. So let's, let's kind of briefly walk through that. If, if I'm someone within the banking industry and I have a suspicion that there might be some fraudulent activity going on with an account, I can use my natural language understanding of what the concern is and then have an, uh, an application or program or function like this be able to translate that into SQL so that it can actually go and query the vast amount of information that I may have within a banking database? Yeah, so if you have this intuition of where to look, asking the right questions um, with the help of kind of taking the context, the data and the schema and your, your kind of the data that you're working with into this whole streamlined workflow, you can ask the question to have it return that query just like you said. Okay, and then this is just banking specific. The, the, the tools, the capabilities of everything that we're doing within SageMaker Studio Lab, I could do the same thing if I was a music director, I could do the same thing if I was a professor, or basically any application or use case where I wanna be able to do just that take what I have in a database and be able to process it based on the natural language understanding of what I'm after. Exactly. The point of this text-to-SQL model uh, is to be cross-domain, is to be able to take uh, questions and, and context of any of the domains that, that you can think of and answer those questions that professionals across the, 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 the bandwidth, uh, the professionals across the spectrum can ask. Awesome. All right, so throughout the duration of this project, Vincent, we're gonna be using several libraries and several models. Explain to the viewers the difference between the libraries and the models. So I think of uh, a model, essentially it's a piece of data. 
it's a it's a collection of ways and biases that are learned through throughout training process. But to really unleash the power to uh, interact with those models, you need dependencies, you need tool sets from Python, pr from other languages, so you can interact and, and make those models do the ideal functions that you are aiming to do. Okay, why don't you now give us a simple walkthrough of the workflow for how a gap or a generation augmented pre-training model works. Right, so here I have a visualization that is uh, from the original paper that's proposed by the researchers. Um, to kind of give you a, a, a more detailed view, I've kind of bro broken this process down into a few steps. So the first thing we, we provide the model is a English question and they call it the utterance. Um, and the other thing you pass in is the data set schema. So the, the gap model uh, takes all of this input and considers those input into one data collection and they call it the uh, data item. So the input goes through the mask uh, language model process. Essentially, they identify the words that are interesting to the specific blob of data that's being passed in. Um, and uh, sometimes they substitute those words with a uh, mask tag that's uh, embedded in the notebook. So after that pre-training, pre-processing, uh, pre um, the, 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 the data is then passed into a 12-layer uh, transformer model, uh, essentially taking each token in the input to be encoded as this contextual form. You think of it as a vector. A, 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 a num number representation of the data that's being passed in. And uh, for three different purposes, they have three different processes that uh, work in, in conjunction. The first is to predict the column that is useful to answer this question within the context of the database, the, the database uh, schema. The second one is to column recover, essentially to, to infer what might this specific number that you mentioned in your you know, question referring to in the, in the database. And the, uh, the third item is to really eventually generate the SQL query that we, we can copy and paste and work off of. Um, and this process really takes a lot of the, the grammar that's learned about the SQL language and the complexity of the, some of the dependencies and, 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 uh, and uh, logic and to put together this one artifact that you use. Okay. I think the viewers will get a better sense for that later as we start getting into some of the natural language toolkit sections of the uh, demonstration. Absolutely. So be because we have loaded in those dependencies, now we have this segment that we call configurations. Uh, essentially, uh, JSON, JSONnet files are, are files that could be evaluated into a JSON for, uh, format so we can read in the model in the exact way that we want. Mm -hmm. So the special thing about JSONnet is that it kind of shrinks down the, the amount of data that you actually need to put into the to file. Uh, it helps evaluate all these configurations, makes, makes the process a little bit more seamless. Avoid us from having to go and do any sort of pre-formatting of the data. It's, it's all done within the project itself. It gets bigger and bigger. We'll, we'll show you a little bit of that visualization as well. So the first step is to load in the uh, gap run .json net. I can give you a little snippet here. Uh, it's within the spider configs uh, file. So one of the more important fields is this model config arguments. So as you can see, there's a Bart version called Facebook slash uh, Bart large. And this is the, the language model that we heavily rely upon to give us a baseline understanding of the human language. And a lot of these other parameters, such as learning rate, uh, attention, uh, and learning rate, these are pre-configured by the authors of the paper um, in, in just in the way that they've experimented to optimize the usage of this uh, uh, BART model. You can only imagine the amount of training that this model has gone through, given that it's being created by a source like Facebook, which yeah. has been a, a very large social media site for years now. And, a lot of language and dialogue going on there for, for this to be trained. It's an exciting space. I, I think the, the as data 
more data are being trained into models and large language models start to show up. And uh, I'm excited to see what's uh, in store for, I, will, I believe it's Alexa TM50B. Mm -hmm. um, uh, don't quote me on that. Let me let me let me go back to that. I'm excited for the large language model that is behind the, the Alexa service as well to see what kind of capabilities that we can come up with. So, reading in the uh, experiment config, as you can see, it's uh, it's not too long yet, but we're going to add a few things into it. So so within the configurations, we want to focus in on the model configurations, and specifically these arguments. Um, all right, because we've pulled in the JSONnet file, this is a JSON load function that helps us with um, configuring the JSONnet file along with some of the other arguments from a separate file. And they can eventually converge into this variable called invert config. All right, so because we have the model figured out, we still need to um, point the model to the data sets that we want to provide. And within data slash SQLite files, this is where we have a custom space that we can configure the exact data sets that we want to work with. And in our case, um, I have uh, put in uh, two separate data sets. One is focused on the bank fraud detection <clears throat> and the other is focused on kind of the machine learning uh, literature. It's a separate database that we can ask some questions about. At the end, we'll see um, the model can work on cross domain, which means different topics, different general topics that you can uh, interact with. And uh, through the way that it learns data sets and your question, it's going to return some uh, reasonably uh, useful answers. And bank fraud detection is just one type of data input that could be processed? What are some examples of some others that could be used? Uh, to answer your question, um, within the data, data subdirectory and within the SQL app files, all these, all these topics are, are free game. Sure. So when you want to ask a question about a different topic, um, at, at the end you'll see that basically we switch the pointer to that uh, directory and you will configure and rerun the the pre-processing and they'll be able to ask more questions about that specific topic. So it could be music, it could be sports related. Right over here. Traits. So you have yeah. academic, you have biking, books. Uh, there's one about movies that was also really interesting. Yeah, the, the possibility is endless here. Nice. Yeah. So we point the model's configuration to the data SQL app files and just to give a brief overview, see the configuration now got, gets really, really big. And uh, here is a interesting object that's uh, specific to this pro uh, project. It's called the infer. So it's basically a wrapper class around the actual model so we can interact with the model. And uh, it takes in the configurations and loads the, the uh, models within this very formatted way so that we don't have to manage all the variables. We just want the infer mm -hmm. as the, the object that we want to talk to. Kind of a filtering mechanism. Basically. Exactly. So the model directory is uh, loaded in and also the checkpoint, just like how we download it, uh, a little sanity check, right? So we have the uh, models directory along with the checkpoint steps. And these are important factors to load in with the infer. So now we finally load in the model. And this is probably going to take a minute or two, just because there are so many uh, dimensions and features to be loaded in from uh, the storage of the, uh, the, the uh, weights and biases that are in the model and also the checkpoint. Um, so, I think you can see that it starts to load the uh, the parameters of the model itself. And the next thing it does is to load in the uh, pre-trained checkpoint. So you can compare and see that the model's actually changing the parameter value based on the checkpoint that it's loaded in. Because the model has been learning all this new knowledge and it updates its 
brain with the new knowledge. Is there an argument that's actually allowing it to go through and, and iterate and rerun every time? Um, I think the model, it's built into the infer class, right? So when we load in the model, it's uh, specific to what model you're loading in and also which uh, pre-trained step, okay. a checkpoint that you want this model to recover to. I notice also the output's kind of truncating some of the values. It's, R roughly it, how many columns would you say there are entirely? Oof, uh, for a deep model like this, it it's very sizable and uh, I wouldn't be surprised there are thousands of, wow. of features in there. Wow. Even, <clears throat> even amazing for a, an environment where you've only got 15 gigabytes of space to work with. One can only imagine if you're working in a much larger environment uh, as most production-based models are, that it could just you know grow tenfold, maybe even a hundredfold. It is. It's a balancing act, right, <laughs> between how fancy you want your models to look and also how cost-efficient the model is for the specific use case that you work with. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely a tricky balancing sure. act, and it really uh, depends on the problem that you solve for your specific uh, circumstances. Yeah. Well, again, the beauty of uh, an environment like SageMaker Studio Lab is that you can start small so that once you've got all of your model parameters, long as, as long as you've got all of your processes together in place, you can then move it into a bigger environment uh, while saving cost and, yeah. and getting yourself ready for the for the bigger environments. Yeah, the be beauty of uh, cloud, right? You can scape, uh, scale horizontally, you can scale vertically. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. All right, I think the loading step is done. And now we come to this segment that we call data set preparation and inference. Uh, again, there are two new uh, functions that we want to load in. One is called uh, dump database JSON schema. As it, the name sound, suggests, right, you're, you're dumping the schema information into a JSON object. Um, the other is to load tables from that schema. So uh, the, the assumption here is that within a given schema, there are tons of different tables, uh, usually for uh, production environments. Uh, for the use cases today, we want to stick with one table within this one schema. So uh, as you can see, eventually there, there might be slight shifts in the SQL that is generated, but you know, it's a minor change, but we, the, the queries are still workable. And not to get too specific into bank fraud, but because uh, this is banking information, some of the table types could be customer related, mm -hmm. they could be transaction related, yeah. uh, they could be associated with some sort of regulatory compliance, things of that nature. Uh, for for the purpose of the demo, the data set is actually a synthetic data set, okay, so right? So we, we, we don't want to infringe on any security absolutely. violation or privacy violation. So uh, as I mentioned, we want to uh, point the, data set, the database ID to this uh, specific data set, data set, and we call it security one, just for our clear, clarity purpose. You can call it whatever you, you would like. And uh, so using the dump database JSON schema, we load in that database. So uh, as we've pointed the database ID to security one, let's try to load in with the dump database schema. And it looks like this time it worked. Now let's uh, see this utility function called refine schema names. Again, there are minor uh, details, for example, primary key and uh, foreign key. Somehow the way they formatted in the original data set was slightly off. So there's this utility that kind of standardized the data set before we sh uh, shift into pre-processing. So uh, let's take a look at what the schema looks like right now. So uh, as previously mentioned in the banking data set, uh, you can see some of the columns that, for example, fraud bullion, income, uh, zip, zip count four weeks in, uh, housing status. It's a lot of parameters that we try to um, keep track of bank fraud and analyze from different angles. All right, it's a long schema. And uh, with this uh, utility, we can start to analyze some of the foreign key relationships. Uh, again, for the specific Data set, there's not too much of a primary key, foreign key relations, but it is the capability is, is there. And the, if you want to run inferences on larger data sets, it's doable. All right, so the schema keys, again, this is a simple data set. Um, now the uh, construction. So 
what what this is doing is um, the schema is being passed in into the schema variable and uh, evaluating the foreign key mapping. Again, this is a simple mapping, but still needs to be passed in. And also uh, taking account what are some of the other data uh, data sets that are within the SQLite files. So we want to make sure the data set is loaded in properly. Uh, now, this is the, the step where the pre-processing of the data set uses uh, some of the Stanford Core NLP package. Um, and before, because we have baked in the uh, Java runtime into Conda environment is going to run some, uh, sim, uh, seamlessly. This is actually a, a, a new, uh, new finding that we worked out uh, during our process. So okay. if, uh, and let's take a look at the spider schema. I don't think we touched much on the spider schema earlier. Mm. Just, just kind of briefly describe what the spider schema is doing. Yeah, uh, I have a link over there, I think. Um, there we go. Okay. So to give a little bit of context of what Spider is, is essentially a uh, challenge for text to SQL uh, models. And within this uh, leaderboard, there are some of the state of the art solutions that are uh, proposed by academia. Uh, to solve this very problem. And if you look at the accuracy, it's getting better and better over, over time. And uh, I am excited to see the day that the accuracy is past 95%. And this is really where some of the processes can be streamlined and uh, uh, you know, the, the productivity as an analyst can be really elevated. Is the increased accuracy due to uh, just more iterations of the training, more data that it's being trained on to produce those higher results? Uh, the learning is just that much better. And uh, with uh, some of the techniques and toolings that are that are just uh, <laughs> filling this market with exciting AI and innovation, I think the, the, the overall technique that we have as developers gets much, that much better. So there, here's a little interesting fact about this project. Uh, so the GAP framework's actually using the Transformers architecture. And I, when I came, came into the studio, I saw these two Transformers, the Megatron and the Primar over here. Uh, it's just great mojo going on today. So uh, essentially, uh, it's, it's a very popular uh, architecture that uh, data scientists are currently using. So I strongly checking out, uh, I strongly recommend checking out the Attention is All You Need paper by uh, Vasvani and all. So th even though this paper is from 2017, it's just a significant uh, progress for our understanding of uh, deep learning. Yeah. Uh, so, some would even dub that as kind of the birth of generative AI, that, that paper. You can and, definitely argue that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you know what we're doing today is really you know within this larger umbrella of uh, natural language processing. So I, I do want to uh, point to the very significant uh, resources over here. So here's a little visualization of what's going to happen in our next phase, which is the actual inference. So when uh, on, the, on the bottom you have your question that we ask, and we call that an utterance, um, and the data schema information that we just processed uh, is also being passed in into the transformer. So the transformer encoder, which is kind of taking all this information and structuring it, structuring it in a way that is formatted, uh, understandable by the, by the model. Um, so there are three main uh, activities that it does. The first one is called uh, mask language model, essentially masking uh, interesting words that are very essential to the analysis um, to kind of focus in on on what is beyond just a large blob of text. Is that a result of having the punct and the stop words uh, packages that we installed earlier? A Great, of? that's a that's a very accurate understanding. And secondly, there is the column recovery. So from just a question and the and the schema, they want to map. What is this word mean, meaning in, in the context of this uh, data schema? So the column recovery. And then the the third one really is the is the encoding of the uh, SQL. We call it the uh, SQL generation, uh, where very complex uh, SQL queries are generated, so we can answer some of the more complex questions. 
So this is a breakdown of the of the sequence sequential steps. I won't go into the uh, too deep of a depth, but sure. uh, most of the viewers will be able to see this once they get a chance to load and, and run this uh, entire project within their own StageMaker Studio Lab environments. Yeah, if we have more questions, I'm more than happy to uh, get connected with the viewers. Perfect. Yeah. So this is the step where where we uh, put together a function that encapsulates the entire process. So on the top side, you see the data item, and um, the text is going to be where your actual question is stored. Uh, the schema is going to be the data set that we processed with, with tokenization, with core NLP, um, and is stored over there. Also, there is the original schema, just in case anything is lost in, the, in translation. So uh, we want to clear any pre-processed pre cache that is built into this model, just to make sure everything runs cleanly. Uh, we have the uh, pre-processing of the data item, which is going to be uh, 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 helping the model understand our specific context for today. And uh, yeah, with uh, the uh, torch null, null gradient uh, argument, this is uh, where the actual inference, the magic, is going to be done. So let's run this function. All right, so as we... Uh, as we kind of explain what's going on inside the infer function, uh, let's uh, fire up our first inference for today. So the question is, what type of uh, device operating systems are used by the customers? And uh, let's uh, give that inference uh, one try. Um, okay, now we see. So one way we can uh, evaluate how useful this query is, is actually run it within the context of a database. So I have a worksheet here loaded up. And uh, as you can see, remember when I was mentioning that the model was looking at things in the schema level? Mm -hmm. Well, right, right now we're running the query inside this table called security one. So the base is actually, it's a filler word that's trying to place at the schema level, but we're, this is not useful for us for today. And uh, select distinct device OS from, and this table is called security one. Now let's try running this query. And look at that, we have some users that use Windows, Linux, Mac, other, and also X11 processors, which is, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good spread of uh, users. Now let's try another question. So let's do, can you provide a breakdown of different payment types used by uh, customers in the database and how many customers use each type of payment? So it's a very complex question and see how the model handles it. But in some ways, we're now starting to get an understanding that if the bank suspects that there's a uh, increase in uh, Android mobile users doing fraudulent activity, that this is a way in which we can start querying on the data yep. to get a sense if that uh, could potentially be the case or not. With all the parameters that we ask the questions, we can piece together some of the profiles of the of the fraudulent users and potentially start to put together a timeline. It could be location based, uh, other parameters as well. Too, oh correct? yeah, yeah, all kinds of uh, everything that's within the uh, purview of the transactional record. You can start to ask questions. Incredible. So let me select this very long query. Um, I think I can already kind of spot one bug here. So because we do want uh, a breakdown of every payment type, so this is go not great that it's only limited to one, there's probably some uh, misunderstanding in the, in the code. So we want to select payment type count from uh, this table name is slightly off and we don't need base over here. And everything other than that, I think we are ready to run this query. And look at that. So payment type AV, there is the 370K plus members and all these data, data, data uh, payment types down to the 200 uh, very niche payment types. And it's just a very nice layout of, you know, what kind of, what kind of payments within the context of the database are. Do the sum total of those uh, values there represent the actual amount of rows that are in the SQLite uh, uh, data source that we're referencing here? Exactly, yeah. So the, the count star from all this filtering is 
cleanly laid out on the count column. It's a, for, for something that only allows 15 gigabytes of data, that is still a relatively large uh, amount of rows. So yeah. pre pretty impressive. Yeah, right. So as we have done some analysis on the banking fraud data set, let's shift gears to ask some uh, machine learning related questions. So within the database called Scholar, we just basically want to run the entire uh, sequence of commands that are relevant to this data set and put together a new inferrer and new infer function so we can ask the questions related to that. So I'm going to zoom through over uh, these pre-processing steps because they are the same, same code, honestly. And uh, right now, again, it's the new infer function that we put together with the specific data item. And uh, one question I have is how many papers are about deep learning? And let's see how the model answers that. So you can see, right, so select distinct uh, paper.paper ID. So con congregate that and from the paper uh, key phrase and also joins the, uh, the paper table on uh, key phrase where the key phrase equals terminal. So because the model is still there are parts that you need the human intervention. Mm -hmm. And for example, the terminal is where, you know, it doesn't quite understand um, the argument deep learning. Is this something that you want to be querying on? Uh, it's just kind of leaving this filler word up. But uh, it's, a, it's a simple copy and paste that hopefully this gives you a, a, a beginning query so you can work off of and get the answers that you want. Um, now the other question will be list all the academic papers on machine learning networks in for one shot learning. It's it's a lot of a lot of buzzwords, and uh, let's see how the model currently handles that. And, and again, right, so it selects the distinct paper IDs from the from the corresponding table, but also left the paper's title with the terminal filler word. And uh, to make it work, I think I'll just put in uh, within this. Uh, uh, quote the one shot learning, and I think uh, you can almost see visually how uh, some of the filler words are being just basically filtered out. Things yeah, like are things like on, yeah, for, mm -hmm. so. yeah. So, so this is kind of my understanding that really the some of the some of the earlier models are working conjunction with with the human uh, workflow, but I don't think they're, they're at the point that can work quite independently yet. So there's, it's a bit of a, a back and forth with our cross-checking with uh, human intervention mm -hmm. to really automate some of the processes. Okay. Um, I think this will conclude our demos for today. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Thank you very much, Vincent. Okay, that wraps up our demonstration today. I want to thank Vincent for providing us with a wonderful presentation. And I'd like to invite everyone out there to access our Grad Project GitHub repo and try this out in your own Amazon SageMaker Studio Lab environment. Have a great day and build on.